listening to the Paranormal Chronicles radio show. Here is your host, paranormal researcher and author of the best-selling A Most Hunted House, Gavin Lee Davis. Welcome, my name is JL Davis, founder of ParanormalChronicles.com and author of the terrifying true account that is Haunted Horror of Haverford West. Dare you take the challenge, read Haunted Horror of Haverford West alone in bed at night. Tonight I have a devilish treat for you, a little something to help you embrace the darkness and face your fears. This series is brought to you by sickfifeandbooks.com. That's sick as in the number six, TH. So visit sickfifeandbooks.com today and explore a world of the paranormal, unexplained and mysterious. If you're new to the show, then explore the archive and listen to real-life chilling encounters of hauntings, poltergeists, Bigfoot, UFOs, and a demon encounter that will terrify you beyond belief. Make sure you follow as our followers are put into a prize draw for one lucky follower to win a sickfifeandbooks.com book and one lucky follower to win an Amazon voucher every month. Press follow now. Plus, every single one of you can read your free digital Paranormal Chronicles magazine today. No sign-up, no subscription, just free reading for you so visit www.theparanormalchronicles.com forward slash magazine we reward our listeners so thank you so much for listening downloading and following and we have some incredible guests coming up so never miss a thing if you have an experience or theory to share then find us at the paranormal chronicles on instagram or facebook tweet at paracron or email paranormal chronicles at aol.com on tonight's show I have a spectacular treat for you all, something different from my usual guests. Tonight, Ander Dumas will present to you a chilling and horrific tale. Ander Dumas is a wonderfully talented horror writer who enjoys making videos about horror films, movies, and pretty much anything spooky on her Ander Dumas YouTube channel. You can listen to her podcast, The Tantalus Feast, to hear her original fiction, and yes, it is terrifying. Ander's YouTube channel is superb. Everything you need to know about horror is there, from reviews on Stephen King to horror movies to up-and-coming horror writers like Bill Halpin and his terrifying must-read book, The Cult of Eden. So, find Ander Dumas on YouTube today, subscribe and support her channel. Ander is one to watch. This tale is from her Tantalus Feast podcast, so make sure you subscribe to that today. And this may be unsuitable for those with a weak disposition or for those that suffer from night terrors. On with the show. Tantalus feast, where we consume horror, fear, and a bit of human flesh. Please, please take your seat. The festivities are about to begin. And help yourself to some supper. But put down the fork and knife, please. Here, we dine with just our hands. And don't worry, if you don't survive the night, You may just end up on next month's menu. After all, meat tends to taste better once it's terrorized. Hello, creeps. Anda here for your monthly dose of horror fiction. As we leave summer and transition into fall, I wanted to bring you a spooky dish. Tonight, please enjoy a plate of maggots, seasoned with a pinch of loneliness, marinated in murder, and served on a bed of gravesite soil. Here you are. Tonight's tale is another carpe noctum. A darker sees the day. And although you may have to claw through six feet of earth to get there, I'm hoping you'll stick around. Tonight's story is entitled, Maggots Like Pearls. I hope you enjoy. Death takes a toll on my body, but not as much as the weight of life. I hear the patter of young teenage feet six feet above my head as I seek comfort in my coffin. I'm not ready to be alive, but are any of us, really? Anastasia, I hear one of the girls, I'm not sure which, they all sound the same, murmur above the ground. It's difficult to hear with dirt in your ears. Anastasia, are you alive down there? A gaggle of snickers follows. Barely, I want to reply. 
but my throat is coarse and my mouth feels sewn shut. I stretch my fists towards my feet, the only available space for movement in my small coffin, and listen to the cracks and groans of my joints. My bones cry out for more rest, but if I stay dead for too long, I'm sure I'd never wake up. Anastasia, it's been four days. It's time to get up. Another small voice burrows into the soil and seeps through the cracks and into my coffin. Four days? It's twice as long as last time. I've died twice already. And this time, I've stayed on the other side longer than the last. Am I worried that one of these times I won't wake up? No, not really. How is death all that different from life to begin with? I hear fingers begin to scratch at the dirt. Handfuls after handfuls are heaved over petite shoulders. They giggle like giddy schoolgirls discussing boys instead of murderers digging up a corpse. Six feet to go, girls. There are still worlds between us. At the sound of the digging, I open my eyes. Not that I can see much wrapped in a cold blanket of absolute darkness, but any sort of visual stimuli, shadows included, help my system acknowledge that we are now among the living and inform my body to follow suit. My lungs begin to breathe deeply. My heart begins to circulate old coagulated blood. As the girls continue to dig and stomp on the earth above me, small streams of dirt leak through the gaps of wood and into my poorly constructed coffin. After you die once, no one wants to splurge on a nice casket, or a funeral for that matter. The first time, of course, was accidental. I swallowed and swallowed and choked and gagged and swallowed some more until I found myself nestled in satin and enclosed in oak. My mother fainted as I crawled from my box at the wake. She never fully woke back up. I slowly slide my hand to my eyes and wipe away the dirt. I rub my hands along my rubbery face. The embalming fluid really does a number on my flesh. I bet she's still dead, I hear an unbelieving voice state matter-of-factly. We can only hope, another responds, and the roar of laughter seems closer now. Five feet left, and once we're face to face, what will change? After my notorious uprising from beyond the grave... I made quite a name in our small town for myself and my family, my mother, brother, and I. My mother couldn't stand the questions. What did you see on the other side? How did she get a second chance? Is it truly even your daughter that has returned? The questions slowly turned to accusations, witchcraft, black magic, a deal with the devil, vampirism, demonic possession. My mother told me to ignore the brutal comments behind her shifty eyes but she always kept her ears perked and at least an arm's distance between herself and me. She often joked of sending me up to the moon, saying that perhaps I could finally even reach the heavens if I were high enough. More often, she joked of bringing me to the Dead Sea. The fear and curiosity kept the townspeople coming back day after day, week after week, month after year. They would stand outside our house and yell obscenities a modern-day mob, but instead of pitchforks, they held cell phones. Instead of torches, they threw crucifixes and rosaries at our doorstep. And instead of killing the monster, they hoped to get a glimpse of the girl that wouldn't die. Just off yourself, my brother so eloquently stated as he bit at a golden apple. I drew the curtains and looked down at the crowd. A group of familiar faces stared back. Clay? What? he responded, without so much as turning around to face me in his chair. That's what they're waiting for. Just go back down to Blair Lake and do it again. He took another bite. You have fans now, whether you like it or not. You have an audience to uphold. A responsibility. His voice was ripe with envy. I had given a speech in fifth grade to try to persuade the class to vote for me as vice president and lost. In sixth, I tried out for a solo in our graduation performance, which was later given to someone more deserving. In seventh, it was the lead in the school play, and eighth, it was the dance team. All of my life, I had tried to weasel my way into others' hobbies and interests, always unsuccessfully, in the hopes of finding those I fit in with, a sheep in wolves' clothing, if you will. I didn't care about politics, I couldn't dance or sing or draw or act or write poetry or surf or play the oboe, I had no interest in karate, and I hadn't acquired an affinity for architecture at an early age. I decided my first year of college would be different. I had chosen the swim team because the standards were low and the competition was nearly non-existent. All summer long, I worked on my times, breaststroke, backstroke, pool laps until my fingers turned to prunes and my lungs begged for oxygen. 
only I knew practicing in the heated pool in the backyard wouldn't guarantee me a spot on the team. My times were mediocre and my form lackluster. I needed a surefire method of finally belonging. The only way to do that was to be the best. I arrived at Blair Lake around noon on a chilly October morning, two weeks before tryouts. I pulled off my clothes and headed towards the lake with determination. I eyed a buoy that seemed a reasonable distance from the shore. This time, I would not fail. I would find my place in this world alongside others, and I would belong. Only, I hadn't anticipated the sharp stabs of the frigid waters. It began in my sides. The lake stuck at my goosebump-covered flesh with small liquid daggers. Then, the pain migrated to my ribs and chest, making it hard to breathe. My lungs burned and felt condensed as I began to swim in a panic, sucked together like two shriveled fish in a can. The cold nipped at my extremities until I could no longer feel my fingers or toes. The numbness spread to my arms and then my legs. I fought to stay buoyant as my body slowly betrayed me, refusing to tread. About halfway to the buoy, I came to the terrifying realization that swimming wasn't my strength, and as I began to swallow and choke on the water, I came to an even more terrifying realization. Swimming wasn't even my passion. More handfuls of dirt are removed from my grave, and I can almost feel the pressure of the world on me decrease with every fistful. Four feet. Four feet left, and instead of enjoying my last moments of alone time before I am returned to the land of the living, I am left thinking of my brother's lifeless eyes. Just off yourself. Make a spectacle they can't resist, and you've got them for life, Clay stated nonchalantly and took another large bite of his apple. I just want to belong, Clay, I responded. Everybody wants to be loved, Anastasia. Everybody, even you, especially you. This is your chance to fit in. By being the girl that rises from the grave, all that's ever done is push me further from others. It's what makes you special, Anna. Don't you get it? You don't have to be like them to fit in. You need to be different. Something they've never seen. If it were me, another bite was taken from his apple. If it were me, I'd and he sat with his thoughts as he sucked on the core. I'd do what they wanted, keep them coming back to me. And at what cost, I asked. People have done worse for much less. Count yourself lucky. These were his last words to me before he walked out of the room and into his own grave. It was later that day that Mom had gotten the call. Clay had gotten a cinder block, chiseled it loose from the back wall that wrapped around our pool, and a rope he had no doubt found nestled in the depths of our garage and canoed out into the middle of the lake. At least we've already got the coffin, Mom joked as she told me the news. She, of course, was referring to the old casket that was moved to the cellar after my miraculous reincarnation. I insisted we keep it and cried when Mom tried to sell it, though, as it turns out, second-hand caskets aren't in high demand. Somehow, the small box brought me more comfort than I had ever felt. Somehow, it felt like the only place I belonged. Maybe Clay was right. After my funeral, I would sit in my room and wait for my mother to take her nightly Valium and shot of whiskey before dozily stumbling off to bed. Once her bedroom door was shut and locked, I would sneak down to the cellar. After I woke up dead, it seemed like the right way to sleep. I would crawl inside the velvet-lined oak box and shut the lid. My mother never spoke a word of it. But after my brother's funeral, she sat by the window in her old, worn rocking chair and unraveled. After leaving the service, I heard her murmur under her breath, Why didn't he crawl out? Why didn't he wake back up? Every night after, she would ask me where he was, as she mumbled incoherently, never removing her eyes from the glass. One night, I tried my best to use Clay's words to explain. I suppose a gift is a gift because it's one of a kind, I responded. You move on to the Dead Sea now, child. Give your brother a chance to live again. I found the pamphlets from boarding school in my mother's dresser after my death. Only, after Clay's funeral, they were scattered throughout the house. One on the kitchen island, the next taped to my vanity, another on the bathroom counter, and finally, my desk. She placed them around the house, pleading for my exit, until I walked out the front door one evening. I made my way through the crowd of onlookers who gasped and whispered as I walked by, parting quickly to ensure I wouldn't make contact with them and spread my curse. I could see my mother's silhouette in the window as I boarded the bus, and although I couldn't tell from where I sat, I knew her lips were ever moving, asking when Clay would return. 
The sound of small shovels work above in unison to free me. Three feet, young grave robbers. Then you'll see what you've done. I began the school year with a fresh start. I thought it would bring me peace to slip into obscurity. But night after night, I sat alone in my dark room, waiting for the opportunity to run into my dorm mate. We had barely spoken a handful of words to each other until one evening when she snuck in behind me as I stared catatonically at a picture of Clay. Who is that? Her voice nearly startled me to my second grave. And no one, I insisted. I had, through classical conditioning, of course, learned to take two steps back when someone approached. But as she turned away from me, I heard myself whisper, He's my brother, in a voice I hardly recognized. Did something happen to him? She asked as she placed a hand on my shoulder. And I couldn't help but wonder, could this finally be where I belonged? Yes, I exhaled, hardly audible. I'm sorry, was her response as she stroked my back. If she would have asked me, I would have become her kitten right then and there, purring in her lap as she studied late at night. At least I'd have a place of my own, a symbiotic relationship that I so desperately craved. That night, as I tossed and turned in bed, as I did every night, I heard her sigh. I hadn't found anything comparable to the comfort of my casket. Do you ever sleep? She whispered through the darkness. I'm sorry. I heard her shuffle, and with the sound of a click, the lights illuminated the room. Are you all right? This question, so strange to my ears, instantly caused my eyes to water. Instead of irritation caused by her interruption of sleep or frustration at my lack of vulnerability, she sounded, dare I say, concerned. She crossed the room and crawled onto my bed. She curled up under the covers with me, and there we sat, nearly nose to nose. She didn't have to speak a word. She only placed her hand on top of mine, and I thought of Clay. I died once, I blurted out quickly, and through the moments of silence that followed, I wonder if that was the right statement to lead with. You died? I died, and then I came back. I waited for the imminent onslaught of questions about what I saw, what it was like, darkness or bright lights, up or down, a beautiful dream or a terrifying nightmare, the selfish line of questioning where the asker begged to be comforted by their own inevitable demise. But she only asked one question. And your brother? He didn't make it, and I wept softly. I coughed up my story and folded it into her palms for safekeeping. Afterwards, her eyes widened and her grin stretched across her cheeks. You have to tell the Connells. The Connells were a group of six relatives, two sisters and four cousins, that were the talk of the school. They were tall, blonde, and beautiful, each a clone of the next, nearly identical and impossible to tell apart. Their reputation preceded them, and if accurate, arose a great deal of questions. Allegedly, they had all been sent to boarding school after setting a neighborhood house on fire. The reasoning behind the fire varied depending on who you were hearing the story from, but the avoidance of jail time was agreed upon by all the school's students. Black magic. The Connells had supposedly cast some sort of spell on the judge, who delivered the punishment with a smile upon her lips. A fancy boarding school where they could get away from whatever demons caused them to ignite the structure. I had heard the story a countless number of times, eavesdropping at the library or walking behind classmates to the cafeteria. I didn't believe it for a second. Rumors are always more grandiose than the truth. Absolutely not, I said, and suddenly, I was looking at the face of a stranger. The faux look of concern that once sat on my roommate's face was now only a mask. She slowly lifted it to reveal her ploy for attention. But they might let me into the group. I've been trying all semester, and this? She stopped mid-sentence to acknowledge her mistake. You. They would finally give you the time of day. Give it some thought, she said before returning to her own bed and flipping off the lights. I sat in the darkness and wondered where I went wrong. It was only a matter of a few days before a beautiful silk envelope was hand-delivered to my door. The letter was an invitation to the Connell suite on the top floor of the dorm building. I had heard rumors of the mysterious invitations and knew how rare and sought after they were. I climbed the steps one by one, knowing that my roommate had told the Connells I had a story that would shock even them. As I rounded the steps to the top floor, I decided that I would simply let them know that there had been a mistake. I knocked. 
No answer. I knocked again. Muffled giggles. A third time I knocked. Silence. I twisted the handle and made my way inside. It smelt of vanilla and suspense. I eyed the photographs on the wall, unable to identify who sat smiling back at me, each set of perfectly aligned teeth and bright blue eyes the same as the next. Another whisper of giggles summoned me from down the hall. A light slightly illuminated the dark passage through a cracked door at the far end of the suite. As I neared the door, the air grew denser. I couldn't tell if it was the way the Connells held back their cackles or if I'd suddenly realized their intentions but for some reason my feet continued to propel me forward, and soon enough I was facing the cold wood that sat in the shadow around the bright lights of the frame. I inhaled deeply and pushed open the door. It took a moment for my eyes to adjust. I can now hear the voices clearer. The shovelfuls of dirt are now being heaved behind shoulders with force. The ground is rockier nearest the casket. Two feet left, and the sour taste of death is slowly receding from my tongue. I roll my neck and twist my wrists. I'm almost ready to live again. I'm so close to the air I can feel myself being pulled from the grips of the earth. The weight has lifted on my coffin, and I could hear the stomping of feet as they shuffle above me, scooping and scraping and sifting to get to my remains. Anastasia, a voice asks in a sing-songy manner. I try to answer, but it's no use. I'm weak and my voice is muffled by theirs and the soil that we use to hide our dead like dirty little secrets. As my eyes adjusted to the brightness, I found myself in a bathroom with the Connells. Their glorious golden locks glowed under a thousand radiating watts. Their perfect complexions and wide eyes stared back at me as six devious smirks twisted the ends of their lips into arrows, all pointed in my direction. Behind them, a bath with crystal clear water filled to the brim sat lifeless, waiting for command. It dared not breathe. I dared not breathe. Finally, one of them spoke. We heard a funny story about you, and instantly my insides ached. We want proof, another said. You in the mood for a swim, a third stated more than asked. I turned back towards the door and a four slammed it shut. I reached for the handle, but suddenly I had a dozen hands on my arm and what felt like a trillion tiny fingers wrapped around my body, and as I struggled, they turned to claws. I started to panic. I pushed and pulled, yelled, and snarled, but this only tightened their grip. I felt my feet taking large, off-balance steps backward. It seemed the more I fought for the door, the further it was being pulled from me. The girls giggled and heaved, then suddenly, momentary silence. My back hit the lukewarm tub water with a splash and I stared up at the six pretty little faces that held me underwater. At first, I didn't fight. I watched the muted laughter until my lungs began to scream. Then instinctively, my body thrashed. I pulled my head up to the surface for a breath, before a perfectly manicured hand pushed back. I began to splash and flail my limbs, throwing fists at anything in my way. This only riled them up. Their laughter faded and their smiles straightened. I gasped and pleaded as I tried to grip anything within reach. And then came blackness, and after came life. The first time I died, it was an accident. The second time was murder. The digging had begun to slow as their dainty hands tired of the manual labor. One foot left, Connells. Better start thinking up an alibi. I turned my sore body from side to side and stretched my hands toward my face. Did you hear that? Someone knocked. I didn't hear anything. Neither did I. Anastasia! If you're alive, knock once. If you're dead, knock twice. And the laughter erupts so loudly it hurts my ears. I remain still in my grave. Perhaps if I don't move, the living will leave me to rot. I told you it was nothing. You can't really believe she's alive down there. She better be. I'm not getting in trouble for this. For what? This. We can't get in trouble for it. She's fine, aren't you, Anna? Even if she's still alive, it doesn't mean we didn't kill her. If a tree falls in the woods, and another uproar sends my fingers to my ears, my elbow knocks the side of the coffin. Shh! I heard it again. (gasps) One knock. She lives. This fastens their pace. The giggles fade, and now all I can hear is the sound of hope. Pulling, scraping, heaving, digging, scooping, burrowing. Leave a lonely corpse alone. You put me here. Now let me rest. 
As much as I longed for the tomb, death was no longer my own. All along I had followed others, aimlessly hoping I'd find my place. I jabbed the rigid edges of my puzzle pieces into shapes and colors that were dissimilar to my own, and only now have I found my passion. Others fence or play golf, knit sweaters or become doctors. My sport is dying. My main hobby? The disappearing act. A knock strikes the lid of my coffin. We're here. And the girls all squeal with excitement. Swiping, swiping, swiping the last of the dirt from my place of internment. My not-so-final resting place. Pull the lid! Pull the lid! It's stuck! Get the hammer! I wait impatiently as each nail is extracted from the wood. I can hear the hammer pulling and the nails peeing as they hit against each other in the dirt. The hammer has dropped. I can hear all six connels inhale deeply. Ready? Wait. A knock comes from above my head. I reluctantly ball up my fist and tap the coffin with a knuckle. Oh my god. The lid is removed and they all fall to their hands and knees to lean in and get a closer look. My little Frankenstein, one says. My eyes begin to water and my hands reach up. The girls work together to pull me from my grave. Their hands gentle and caring. They hug and kiss and rub at my flesh. They gawk at my open eyes, my drawing breath. They brush dirt from my hair and shoulders. They all ask questions at once as they work to lift my weakened body from my six-foot-deep ditch. I claw at the earth and pull myself onto a patch of soft green grass. I feel as though I have just crawled my way up from Hades. I turn onto my back and stare up at the stars that twinkle and wink from the heavens. The cool breeze tugs at my hair and the trees dance above me. I wipe the dirt from my face and roll over onto my knees. Above me stands the six connels. They pull me to my feet and I balance on legs thick with embalming fluid and sleep. They embrace me in a way I have never been touched. They coddle me and brush at my back and thighs. They straighten my hair and tell me that everything is okay. And as I stand with arms interlocked with theirs, hands on my face and crooks of arms wrapped around my neck, my pieces don't seem so sharp. One of the connels steps forward in front of me. We got you something, she says. She pulls out a black rose from a bag on the floor, our form of an olive branch, and I accept. How are you feeling? She asks, as she rubs her thumb down the length of my cheek, like a tree that has fallen in the woods, and the connels giggle into the night. Welcome back, little creeps. I hope you're full of fright from tonight's feast. Do tune in next month. And I saved her favorite tale for October, of course. See you pre-corpses in another life. There we have it. A wonderfully chilling tale. Anna Dumas has quite the dark imagination. She would not be one I would wish to fall out with. Andu Dumas' YouTube channel is superb, a devotion to all things horror. Please follow Andu Dumas on YouTube and check out her Tantalus Feast podcast. There are lots more great horror stories to help you sleep. Anda has a remarkable talent, and one day she will be the queen of horror writing. I know this. Don't forget to follow so you never miss an episode, and we have great guests lined up to explore our archive for great paranormal guests and witnesses who have encountered ghosts, Bigfoot, UFOs, and more. Our followers are put into a monthly prize draw to win a sick-books.com book and also a quarterly draw to win an Amazon voucher. Our next Amazon gift draw is in December, so press follow now. Enjoy your free-to-read paranormal digital magazine, The Paranormal Chronicles. The magazine is the who's who of the paranormal world featuring their experiences and research in this free digital magazine. So visit www.theparanormalchronicles.com forward slash magazine and get reading. There are four free editions for you waiting. Now let me leave you with this. It's that time of year where I think of the 17th century poem, The Apparition. When by thy scorn, O murderous, I am dead, and that thou thinks thee free from all solicitation from me, then shall my ghost come to thy bed. I am Jill Davis. Thank you for listening. Sleep well.
I've never met a dead person I didn't like is the extraordinary travels of a young, alone, and broke psychic in the highly anticipated new book from internationally renowned psychic, medium, medical intuitive, and best-selling author Sherry Dillard. Critics have described I've never met a dead person I didn't like as an engrossing memoir, an empowering story of how a broken girl came to accept her psychic gift, a refreshing and fun read. I've Never Met a Dead Person I Didn't Like is available through Amazon, Kindle, Barnes & Noble, and wherever books are sold. How far would you go to protect the children in your care? Nyla's Babies is the terrifying, chilling book from Jack Simonson, in which a young nanny battles an ancient demon for the souls of the twin babies in her care. Critics have heralded Nyla's Babies as an impressive and vivid imagined story, compelling and devilishly spooky, shocking and haunting. Nyla's Babies is available on Amazon, Kindle or wherever books are sold. Visit CosmicEgg-Books.com for more on Nyla's Babies. Sixth books will take you to other worlds, haunt you, open your mind and push you far beyond the veil of the unknown. Sixth Books is a leading publisher of books on the body, mind and spirit, the paranormal, consciousness, ancient wisdom and the afterlife. Explore today, learn today, open your mind today, read today. Visit sixth-books.com today. The world as you know it is about to change. Do you wish for more paranormal and spiritual content? The Paranormal Chronicles magazine is a free digital magazine crammed with the very best in paranormal and spiritual articles and features. No sign-up, no subscription, just free reading and knowledge for you. Read today at www.theparanormalchronicles.com forward slash magazine. Hi there, my name is Claire Waters and I would like to invite you on an incredible journey. I have written a book based on my personal experiences called Raising Faith a true story of raising a child psychic medium. It's my family's extraordinary experiences with our young daughter's ability to communicate with spirits and the inspirational lessons learned on our journey. Raising Faith is currently available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kindle and wherever books are sold. Join me on this beautiful and incredible adventure. For more information on Raising Faith, visit my website raisingfaith.co.uk or my Facebook page Raising Faith Book. See you there! The international chart-topping, haunted horror of Haverford West has been described as terrifyingly real, a must-read, shocking and chilling brilliance, genuinely worrying, utterly frightening, don't read before bed. Described as one of the spookiest writers out there, best-selling author G.L. Davies presents Haunted Horror of Haverford West. The true paranormal account that is shocking the world. Dare you enter? Dare you read? Haunted. Horror of Haverford West is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kindle, and wherever books are sold. Pray you never have to live there. <laughs>